This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On November the 9th, the Museum of the Institute held its third annual Military History Symposium. Our theme was Canada's Second World War, Combined Arms in Victory. Our second of six speakers was Dr. Jeff Noakes of the Canadian War Museum on Canada's Naval War. preeminent historians and curators in Canada. Dr. Jeff Noakes is the curator of the Second World War Gallery at Canada's War Museum. He's an expert in his field and today he's going to speak to us on Canada's Naval War, which he will expand further on, but if you could please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Jeff Noakes. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start by thanking the Royal Canadian Military Institute, um, and Ryan in particular, for the invitation to participate in this symposium. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I will start with a few very brief notes, as something sometimes these things must start with. Um, the views and interpretations provided in this presentation don't necessarily reflect those of the Canadian War Museum, the Canadian Museum of History of the Government of Canada. Um, not that anyone's ever raised that as an issue, but I always figure it's better to say it than to regret not having said it. Um, also, while the presentation will be in English, I'll be happy to answer questions and discuss matters in either English or in French. So as Ryan said, my talk today will be about Canada's Naval Second World War. And when we first began discussing my involvement in the symposium, we decided on this approach so that I would be talking not only about the Royal Canadian Navy, but also the Merchant Navy, and a few of the ways in which the war at sea affected the lives of everyday Canadians in the country in which they live. So for Canada and Canadians, uh, the Second World War began at sea even before their country was officially at war. On the evening of September 3rd, just hours after France and the United Kingdom declared war on Germany in the wake of its invasion of Poland, the German submarine U-30 torpedoed the British liner Athenia in the Atlantic Ocean. The ship was carrying just over 1,100 passengers and 300 crew. Among them were Americans and many Canadians. Unfortunately, Athenia did not immediately sink, and the weather was good, and other civilian ships were nearby to render assistance along with Royal Navy warships. Despite favorable conditions, 112 passengers and crew ultimately perished, some in the explosion, others in accidents involving lifeboats, and still others of the injuries they suffered. In total, some 54 Canadians died. Among the dead were Hannah Baird, who we see here, and until about six weeks ago, I'd never actually seen a photograph of her, um, but I did manage to find this one. This 66-year-old Scottish-born grandmother had accompanied a family overseas earlier in the summer and was returning to Montreal as a stewardess of Athenia. She would be among the first, but would be far from the last Canadian member of the Merchant Navy to perish in the war, and was also one of several Canadian women merchant mariners who lost their lives in the conflict. The event gripped Canada on the brink of war. Many newspapers, including those here in Toronto, carried stories about local residents who had taken passage aboard the ship. And we see some examples here, and you'll find this in newspapers across the country, both large and small. Ten-year-old Margaret Hayworth, who had been wounded by the torpedo's explosion, succumbed to her injuries on the trip to Halifax. Her funeral in Hamilton gained nationwide attention. By that time, the country was at war, and her death was held up as evidence of German malice. While this was actually not a deliberate act by Germany in sinking an ocean liner, and the German government tried to cover this up, although unsuccessfully because I'm here talking about it this way, <laughs> the sinking of the Athenia was taken as a deliberate premeditated attack on a passenger ship, and it recalled Germany's unrestricted submarine campaigns of the First World War. Pre-war plans developed for convoys, including the control and routing of merchant shipping, were already being implemented, and Canada would be an integral part of these essential but often unheralded aspects of the naval war. And indeed, as these events were unfolding, Canada was already moving to a war footing. Coastal defenses were being activated. The Royal Canadian Air Force was deploying its limited strength of modern, well, or at least semi-modern, aircraft to the Atlantic coast 
and Royal Canadian Navy destroyers raced to transit the American-controlled Panama Canal from the Pacific to the Caribbean before Canada's entry into the war would lead the still neutral Americans to bar them from using the canal. And these reinforcing destroyers were essential. The Royal Canadian Navy of September 1939 was a small force divided between two coasts. It consisted of a handful of destroyers, including HMCS Saguenay, which we see here shortly after her launching in 1931, a few modern minesweepers, an assortment of armed trawlers, and HMCS Venture, a recently built sail training schooner. Some 3,500 officers and men and a network of naval reserve units across the country provided a nucleus for a force that would grow to more than 350 warships and to a peak of over 90,000 personnel including the close to 7,000 wrens of the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service. The RCN's primary operational focus, and the operations for which it remains best known during the Second World War, centered on the Battle of the Atlantic. Fought across a vast and often dangerous ocean, this pitted the Royal Canadian Navy, the Royal Canadian Air Force, and other Allied forces against German U-boats, surface ships, aircraft, and other Axis forces. Allied convoys sought to transport vital food, supplies, weapons, and personnel across the Atlantic, while the Axis sought to destroy merchant vessels and their escorting warships. As Mark Miller has noted, and I quote, the bedrock of Allied strategy in the Atlantic War was the successful movement of people, ships, and material, unquote, or as it was said at the time, the safe and timely arrival of shipping. Without success here, Britain would be unable to stay in the war, and the Allies would be unable to successfully continue the war against Germany. Now, while the focus on the Battle of the Atlantic has often been on the spectacular and the tragic, be it the sinking of U-boats or the loss of Allied merchant ships and warships, the everyday reality of the battle was less dramatic, but no less vital. And it also encompassed the dangers, and it's worth reinforcing these, of weather, accident, collision, and other risks, including outright mechanical failure. It was the longest campaign of the Second World War, and Canadians and Canadian ships were involved from its start, as we have seen with Athenia, up to its very end, because the last merchant ship to be sunk during the war with Germany was the Canadian registered Avondale Park, torpedoed on 7th May 1945. As these losses suggest, the merchant navy was equally a part of this epic struggle. Some 400 merchant ships were built in Canada during the Second World War, and Canadians also served in a range of allied merchant ships from many countries, including some from German-occupied nations such as Norway. These merchant ships and their crews, such as this tanker that we see here in a convoy, were a vital part of the Allied war effort. Transporting personnel and munitions and weapons and food, as I've already mentioned, across the world's oceans, and not just the Atlantic, they faced enemy attack and ever-present dangers of weather and accidents. Enemy action sank some 70 Canadian and Newfoundland merchant vessels, and over 1,600 Canadians and Newfoundlanders uh, including Hannah Baird, as we've seen here, were killed. But the Atlantic was not the only focus of the Royal Canadian Navy or the Canadian Merchant Navy during the war. And today I'll also aim to provide a brief overview of the other elements of Canada's naval war, including in European waters, the Pacific, as well as some of the implications for the war uh, at sea on the Canadian home front. But to return to the Atlantic and to the convoys of merchant ships that formed the center of the struggle, we see one, one such convoy here from about 1942-1943. Convoys, and you'll often see this confusing mixture of letters and numbers used to designate them, were given letter designations that describe their route and sometimes their speed as well, followed by a number such as HX1, the first outbound convoy from Halifax to the UK in 1939. The merchant ships were grouped by their speed. For the HX convoys, like the ones I've just mentioned, the average speed of ships early in the war was nine knots, or just a bit under 17 kilometers per hour. Um, there were slower convoys, by the way, um, and where, where the average speed would literally be 7.5 to 8 knots, or even less. So think 14 kilometers an hour going across the Atlantic. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. These are, these are not jet skis. This is not unfolding at high speed. This is day upon day upon day. Um, and night upon night crossing the Atlantic, even when there was no other danger present. And other dangers were always present. Wolf packs of German submarines, which are often called U-boats, you'll hear me use this a lot, partly to keep the speech shorter, um, were coordinated from shore and, gave, and coordinated between each other using radio 
and gave U-boats the capacity to devastate convoys in the first part of the Second World War, especially once enough U-boats were in service to sustain a substantial force at sea. Spread out in patrol lines uh, astride across the anticipated paths of convoys, and sometimes the Germans knew this in advance when they were able to read Allied codes, the packs allowed individual German submarines to locate Allied convoys then call in reinforcements for an attack. And while the popular image may be of submarine attacks taking place with U-boat commander at Periscope, a lot of these attacks also took place at night on the surface, because U-boats were faster on the surface and they could use their high speed to close with and attack convoys and escape. Despite the Battle of the Atlantic's spectacular beginning with the sinking of the Athenia, much of the first year of the war saw the U-boat threat relatively constrained. And this is both by the relatively limited number of U-boats available, and also by the necessity of them having to make lengthy voyages from German bases to operational areas off the British Isles and in the Atlantic. The German conquest of Norway and France in the spring and summer of 1940, however, dramatically changed this. With bases established along the coasts of both of these countries, U-boats could now reach their operational areas more quickly, more safely, and remain on station longer. And the results were devastating for Allied convoys. Despite this, the U-boat offensive still remained some distance away from Canadian shores. I talked ahead here, but that's all right. Um, it's a little preview. With the United States still officially neutral, although participating in neutrality patrols and other actions in the Atlantic, Germany wanted to avoid a provocative attack that might bring the America into the war. Japan's attack upon the United States and other allied countries in December of 1941 uh, was followed by a German declaration of war on the United States, uh, which removed these constraints on U-boat operations in North American coastal waters. And this included Canadian and Newfoundland coastal waters, including the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Lower St. Lawrence River, both of which became battlegrounds. And the painting here is by Harold Beamont, who in addition to being an accomplished war artist, was also a naval commander during the Second World War and a participant in the Battle of the St. Lawrence. From 1942 to 1944, German U-boats sank 23 naval and, naval and merchant ships in the St. Lawrence. In 1942, U-boats sank merchant ships at the vital iron ore mines at Belle Isle, Newfoundland. But improvements in anti-submarine defenses, and if Roger Sardi were here, he would talk about this quite extensively, more knowledgeably than I can, ultimately stemmed these losses and drove the U-boats away, where they sought seeking less threatening environments for operations. I'll also mention that this expanded U-boat offensive was even more destructive in American coastal waters, where U-boat attacks on shipping led to alarming losses in 1942, as American forces sought to reinforce their defenses. Now, the Wolf Pack tactics I mentioned earlier, and especially their reliance on frequent communications ultimately contributed to the U-boat's undoing. As the Allies became increasingly able to read encrypted German messages, they could anticipate the U-boat's movements. Even when they're unable to decrypt messages, shore-based Allied direction finding stations allowed the U-boats, to location of U-boats to be plotted with a certain degree of accuracy, and relatively speaking. Um, these stations included HMCS Coverdale near Moncton, New Brunswick, where this photograph was taken. Remembers the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service kept a constant watch on radios, ready to establish the bearings of signals and to transcribe the messages that were then forwarded to facilities such as the now famous Bletchley Park. Ashore, the combination of bearings and decrypted signals, along with other operational intelligence, allowed the tracking of U-boats locations, although not always precisely, and also enabled the routing of convoys to avoid attacks, which is just as important. Later in the war, it also allowed hunter-killer groups to be sent to seek and destroy German U-boats. The plotting room we see here was located in Ottawa, Ontario, and similar facilities were found in other locations in Canada and other allied countries. Another key element about U-boats that's worth remembering is that they're strictly speaking submersibles. We often say submarines, but these are, these are vessels that are tied to the surface. They need air. The crews need air, um, for starters. Um, but until the advent of the snorkel breathing tube, a little bit more about that later, U-boats could only operate underwater on battery power. This limited their range and speed while they were submerged. So in order to be mobile, they had to operate on the surface, operating under the power of their diesel engines, which also recharged their batteries. Not only were they faster running on the surface, but they could also keep a better lookout 
um, for signs of convoys, which could sometimes be betrayed at relatively long distances by smoke emitted from careless, um, careless stoking of furnaces on ships, boilers, as we saw in the earlier convoy photograph. Under favorable conditions, surface U-boats could even outrun some Allied escorts, especially corvettes, but that was not always the case, as we see here. On the surface, they were no match for more capable escorts, such as destroyers, which led to a number of notable surface duels, including this battle between HMCS Assiniboine and U-210, which ended in U-210 being rammed and sunk, although not without significant damage to Assiniboine in the process. As the war progressed, improved anti-submarine sensors, weapons, tactics, and tactics meant that submerging to escape attacks from Allied escorts was increasingly dangerous for U-boats. At the start of the war, the nature of ASDIC, as, which is what the Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy called sonar at the time, meant that contact with the submerged U-boat would be lost during the final run-in before an attack. So before the, the corvette or the, we could, be, could pass over the U-boat that was attacking, contact would be lost, which led to a certain degree of uncertainty and a chance of the U-boat suddenly changing course to escape attacks. A head-throwing weapons, like the squid we see here, were meant to be launched ahead of the ship while the U-boat was still detected by Aztec, greatly increasing the chance of a kill. And this photograph here, it's one of the photographs from the War Museum's collection. It's an, as we look say, an amateur photograph. It's certainly not an official photograph. Um, certainly probably may not have been even taken with official permission um, of a squid projectile going off in relatively shallow water in the Irish Sea late in the war. At the same time, surface U-boats also came under increasing threat from aircraft. The gradual extension of air cover across the entire North Atlantic, shrinking and ultimately eliminating the infamous Black Gap, as it was called, where no Allied aircraft could operate, not only led to increased U-boat losses, but also prompted U-boats to increasingly operate submerged during the daytime. This limited their mobility, their ability to recharge their batteries, and also their capacity to spot convoys. Shore-based aircraft, especially consolidated liberators like the ones we see here, that were modified for very long-range operations, as well as aircraft operating from, from escort carriers, like the example we see here in the Narrows at St. John's, um, and even from merchant aircraft carriers, could provide air cover in the middle, even in the middle of the Atlantic by 1943. The consistent arrival of Allied aircraft in the mid-Atlantic helped spell the end of U-boats' ability to operate on the surface with impunity. So, while May of 1943 has often been described as Black May, and this term may be familiar to some of you, um, it's often marked as the major turning point in the Battle of the Atlantic. The Germans abandoned wolf pack operations on a large scale. German losses peak right before this time, and the German submarine offensive was never able to be as destructive as it was before that point. This doesn't mean that the U-boat war is over. There's an unsuccessful attempt in the fall of 1943 to restart the offensive with improved anti-aircraft armament on U-boats, acknowledgement of the threat from aircraft, and acoustic combing torpedoes meant to target escorts. This led to some significant Allied losses, including the destroyer HMCS St. Croix, but German losses made such efforts unsustainable. The subsequent introduction of the snorkel, which is what we see here, so it's the largest of the three items on the screen on the right, uh, with a cloud of water vapor coming out of it, was a breathe this was a breathing tube, and it allowed U-boats to operate on their diesel engines while running just below the surface. It reduces the, effect of air, the effectiveness of aircraft and also restores some mobility to the U-boats over longer distances because they don't need to use their batteries. They also permitted, um, Snorkel also permitted U-boats to switch to inshore operations in shallow waters. This substantially complicated the task of Allied anti-submarine forces and permitted operations until the last days of the war. And this includes the sinking, the sinking of HMCS Esquimalt of Halifax in mid-April of 1945 just a few weeks before the end of the war with Germany, although the cost to U-boats was heavy. And the challenge of locating submarines in shallow waters with all of the um, technical uh, difficulties that presents is still something of an issue today. Now, if these developments caused continued worry to Allied commanders, which they did, the possibility of even newer models of German U-boats created additional apprehension. Type, type 21 and the smaller Type 23 submarines offered greater underwater endurance, higher underwater speed, and a heavier torpedo armament. The Allies were aware of these developments and worried about the challenge they would pose to existing anti-submarine forces and tactics. 
Um, there are some documents out there where they're trying to estimate how many escorts you would need to deal with simply one Type 21 submarine. It's, it's on the order of 10 to 12 frigates around the convoy. It would have been a major challenge. But fortunately, teething problems with these new designs, which were exacerbated by late war material shortages and damaging to manufacturing, assembly, and transportation facilities inflicted by Allied bombing, meant that the threat from these submarines remained almost entirely theoretical. <coughs> the significant Canadian role in the Battle of the Atlantic, and especially in convoy protection, was reflected in the creation of the Canadian Northwest Atlantic as an Allied theater of war. It would also be the only one commanded by a Canadian, Rear Admiral Leonard Murray, and we see his uniform here. From 1943 to 1945, as Commander-in-Chief Canadian Northwest Atlantic, Murray was responsible for convoys in this area and commanded the Canadian and Allied forces protecting them. So, I had said this would not be entirely about the Battle of the Atlantic, and it won't be. So, in addition to its heavy involvement in the Battle of the Atlantic, the Royal Canadian Navy contributed to Allied operations in European waters, carrying out coastal patrols, convoy escort duty, and support operations in the waters around and near the United Kingdom and later further afield. This was an important contribution to the naval war that raged in these areas. The Navy also formed part of Canada's reaction to the German push westwards in the summer of 1940 that led to the fall of France. Canadian destroyers were sent to reinforce the Royal Navy, and one of them, HMCS Fraser, was lost by collision during the evacuation of Allied forces from France in June of 1940. Many of Fraser's survivors, including Horace Stark, who we see here, were subsequently lost when their new ship, Marguerite, was also lost in collision, although this time with the freighter, later the same year. Canadian ships and naval personnel took part in subsequent operations in the Channel and European coastal waters, including anti-submarine operations that ranged as far as the French coast. During one of these operations in August 1943, HMCS Athabaskan became the first warship ever to be hit by an air to surface guided missile. She fortunately survived. The nearby sloop HMS Egret was not so fortunate but Athabaskan would be lost in April 1944 during destroyer operations that helped pave the way for the D-Day landings. In mentioning the D-Day landings, um, more than 100 Canadian warships and some 10,000 Canadian sailors supported the landings in Normandy. Canadian ships and sailors helped protect the invasion fleet, cleared German minefields, and the actions of the minesweepers are a truly fascinating part of that, of that story, and ferried Allied troops across the channel. Um, and the photographs we see here are actually taken by uh, James Grant, a telegraphist aboard one of the Canadian-operated uh, landing craft infantry large. Um, they were running out of creative names for ship types by that point, it would appear. Um, but he, because he wasn't needed as the landings were unfolding, he took a whole series of photographs of events, um, you know, of, the, of events on the beach at Bailey Seal Mail in the morning of June 6, 1944. I'll also mention a bit further afield uh, that Canadian ships and naval personnel also took part in operations in the Mediterranean. These included convoy escort work, raids and amphibious landings in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, as well as Operation Dragoon, the August 1944 landings in the south of France. The Canadian landing ship's infantry, Prince Henry, which we see here in a painting by Alex Colville, um, and Prince Robert, which had, both of which had also taken part in D-Day along with their associated landing craft, also took part in Operation Dragoon. Um, now we're going to skip to the Soviet Union because Canadians and Canadian ships, and this is both warships and merchant ships, also ranged far, the, far to the north. Following the Soviet Union's entry into the war against Germany, um, following Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, the Western Allies established convoys carrying much needed supplies to Soviet ports, Arctic ports, most notably Murmansk, and this photograph was actually taken by the same gentleman who took the earlier one, James Grant. He was later in destroyers and was on some of the last Arctic convoys. And this is taken just before the end of the war in Europe. Um, and these North Sea operations also involved Canada's first two aircraft carriers, HMS Nabob and HMS Puncher, um, depicted here at Scapa Flow in the Orkney Islands. Although they were formerly part of Britain's Royal Navy, Canadians commanded and provided most of the crew for these two escort carriers. Um, severe damage from a German torpedo ended Nabob's operational career, but extraordinary damage control efforts by her crew kept her afloat and enabled her to return to Scapa 
Sister ship Puncher served until the end of the war and subsequently helped repatriate Canadian personnel. <coughs> now, while much of the focus of the Royal Canadian Navy's wartime efforts, much of the focus of this talk, of course, was on the Atlantic and European waters, the Royal Canadian Navy was active in operations along the Pacific coast from 1939 to 1945, patrolling British Columbia waters and helping to support the Allied war effort um, further, further from shore. West Coast shipyards built, repaired, and modified ships, and shore establishments such as HMCS Naden helped train thousands of sailors. In Raleigh Murphy's painting, the banger my class minesweeper HMCS Miramichi streams pa steams past the boom vessels um, and the open anti submarine nets near Squimalt's distinctive Fiskard lighthouse. Following the outbreak of war, and a talk about operating further, further from Canadian shores, German mer merchant vessels um, interned themselves or hit out in neutral ports in Central and South America, and they were suspected of planning breakouts to resupply and refuel surface raiders that were hunting Allied ships. HMCS Prince Robert took part in patrols to prevent this from happening, and in September of 1940, a boarding party from this ship captured the German merchant ship Vaser. And in this photograph, uh, we see German prisoners who are being searched as they, once again as they're being brought ashore in Squimalt. Japan's entry into the war in December of 1941 had immediate effects for the Royal Canadian Navy's Pacific Coast operations. Um, obviously, there's not suddenly a threat on the Pacific Coast that was not there before. Japan's early victories made British Columbians fear an attack, possibly assisted by local Japanese Canadians, um, and also inflamed pre-existing prejudices, which led to some racially, some, which led to racially motivated pressure for the removal of Japanese Canadians from the West Coast. Ultimately, the RCN's fishermen's reserve, and their part in, this, in these actions, um, confiscated over a thousand fishing boats and gathered them at Steveston near Vancouver. And some of you have seen the famous photographs of the fishing boats tied up there. As with other confiscated property, these boats were subsequently sold for far less than their true value. The war also led to an expansion of shipbuilding in Vancouver and Squimalt. Um, in this October 1943 painting, Raleigh Murphy um, shows a half dozen frigates in various stages of completion in the background, while, while HMCS Vancouver, the corvette tied up to the quay at the center, um, and talking about serving further away from the Canadian coast, served on two occasions with the United States Navy in Alaska and the Aleutian Islands campaign. Um, and as an interesting counterpart to the Arctic convoys, it's also worth noting that from 1941 onwards, Soviet ships increasingly called at Canadian ports, not only to transport lend-lease supplies, but also for repairs and modifications. Now, this tremendous growth in the global scope of operations required a much larger Royal Canadian Navy. Ships had to be built, obviously, repaired and maintained, and personnel recruited, trained, and, super and supported. It was a daunting and at times seemingly insurmountable challenge to train and build up the RCN, while at the same time meeting increasingly demanding operational requirements, especially as the U-boat campaign intensified and shipping losses grew. The all too small cadre of interwar personnel was simply not enough to completely accomplish both objectives. As a result, in the early years of the war, Canadian ships often put to sea with their complements not trained to the same standards as later in the conflict. The dilemma was unenviable, but also unavoidable. Put ships in service without enough working up, or suffer losses due to the absence of escorts while more training was carried out. Wartime pressures led the RCN to adopt the former solution, but the consequences for operational effectiveness, um, effectiveness coupled with delays in, ship, in warship upgrades and assignment um, to escorting slower and more vulnerable convoys stretched the RCN to its limits and contributed to merchant ship losses that led to the temporary withdrawal of Canada's mid-ocean escorts in early 1943. The RCN's wartime expansion also saw close to 7,000 women in naval service. Founded in 1932, the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service, often called the Wrens after their, after their British counterparts, performed a wide range of non-combatant roles ashore, both in Canada and abroad. And it's worth remembering in this context that Newfoundland counts as abroad at the time because it's not yet part of Confederation. Assigned to non-combat roles, they performed a wide range of duties, some of which I've already mentioned, but others which included clerical and administrative work as well as signals duties and a range of other tasks. The Navy also had a presence on the home front. As Canada's principal man, we see an example here, 
in Canada's principal Navy town, Halifax, which has been home to sailors since the colonial period. War artist Tom Wood depicts a nighttime patrol of naval police on Barrington Street, um, for, for reasons peculiar to Barrington Street. Um, but Halifax Harbor is visible in the background, as is the silhouette of the prominent crane at the naval dockyards. Um, in a city crowded with up to 50,000 military personnel during the Second World War, Barrington Streets and other parts of Halifax hosted what could politely be described as a thriving and boisterous nightlife. <laughs> the war at sea drew on Canada's shipbuilding capacity on the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, yes, but also stretched out to locations further away, including here in Toronto. So Charles Goldhammer's 1942 paint watercolor shows a minesweeper under construction at the Toronto Shipbuilding Company's yards. A significant part of Canada's wartime shipbuilding occurred in ports along the Great Lakes and along the St. Lawrence and even as far away as in the Muskokas for some of the smaller ships like boats like vessels like Fairmiles. Here in Toronto, naval construction and related industries employed thousands of wartime workers, um, building ships ranging from minesweepers to landing craft. Um, while many of these were built for the Royal Canadian Navy, others were built for the Royal Navy, and still others built for British, uh, the British Ministry of War Transport. So despite, in some cases, because of the growth in shipbuilding capacity and output, problems arose with arming, equipping, and updating warships. Despite the development of domestic manufacturing capabilities, Canadian ships often faced a longer wait for newer equipment. Sometimes this was also the result of competing inter-allied allocation priorities for scarce equipment. The shipyard facilities necessary to upgrade existing warships were also stretched to capacity with new construction and with repairs for damage inflicted by the enemy by accident or by weather. Some of this work consequently had to be undertaken in British and American shipyards. Again, back in Toronto, in addition to the building of ships, weapons, and naval equipment across the country, the Royal Canadian Navy itself also became a visible presence elsewhere on Canada's home front outside ports such as Esquimalt and Halifax. Naval imagery appeared in fundraising and propaganda materials, while Canadians were also encouraged to support the Navy and Merchant Navy through donations and volunteer work. This, this spanned a broad range of materials, from war bonds and war savings stamps posters to encouragement to war workers to stick at their jobs, to the involvement of naval personnel in public ceremonies, both large and small such as his October 1943 victory loan ceremony at Old City Hall. Um, I'll just mention in passing here, if you want interesting examples of home front activities that you see at sea, um, the gentleman on the right is wearing a hand-knitted sleeveless jumper, and on the left with the highlighting there is a project I'd be happy to talk about later about the Siemens Fur Vests Project, which repurposed old fur coats for use by sailors in the Navy and Merchant Navy, and some of that activity was centered here in Toronto. <coughs> With Germany's defeat in May 1945, its U-boats were required to surrender to Allied forces. The Royal Canadian Navy was involved with this surrender in European waters, including escort Group 9's escorting an entire group of surrendering U-boats from the North Sea to Loch Arable in Scotland, which we see here, and it's an original wartime color photograph, it's not been colorized. Um, U-180 and, and, sorry, U-190 and U-889 surrendered to Canadian forces in the Western Atlantic, were brought to ports in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. Also happening at Nova Scotia port in Halifax, victory celebrations were marred by extensive rioting, driven by various factors, including long-standing tensions between service personnel and the city. This particular photograph was taken outside what is now the Black Binney House National Historic Site in Canada, so a building in downtown Halifax that's still standing, um, looking down Hollis Street, and it shows some of the damage and looting taking place. As the war with Germany drew to a close and the Allies' focus shifted increasingly to Japan, the RCN prepared for an increased role in the war in the Pacific and Southeast Asia. Some Canadian sailors had already been serving in Royal Navy ships engaged in fighting Japan, while a few other Canadian ships had operated in the area or were beginning to do so. HMCS Prince Robert had escorted sea force to Hong Kong in 1941 and would return to help liberate that British colony in 1945. The cruiser HMCS Uganda served with the British fleet, Pacific fleet, near the end of the war, while HMCS Ontario was on her way to the Pacific when Japan capitulated. Other Canadian ships were in the midst of updates for tropical service or transiting to the Pacific when the sudden end of hostilities interrupted these plans. But just days before the Japanese capitulation, Lieutenant Robert Hampton, often known as Hammy Gray, became the only member of the Royal Canadian Navy to be awarded the Victoria Cross. On 9th August 1945, 
flying off the British carrier HMS Formidable, Gray led a flight of Corsair fighter bombers into Onagawa Bay, Japan. With his aircraft riddled by anti-aircraft fire from the shore and from warships in the bay, Gray pressed home an attack on the Japanese ship Amakusa, which we see here, sinking it. But his badly damaged and burning aircraft crashed moments later, killing him. In the war's aftermath, the Royal Canadian Navy, which had faced an urgent and rapid buildup, along with its consequent growing pains, was rapidly demobilized as Canada and Canadians sought to return to peacetime life after six years of war, and it's worth remembering after about a decade of depression before that. The RCN had lost 14 warships to the enemy attack and another eight ships to accidents. Some 2,000 of the Navy's men and women lost their lives. These corvettes, moored at Sorel, Quebec, and soon to be sold for scrap, attest to the scale of post-war demobilization. This painting was actually by Tony Law, and I think I might have managed to advance it by accident. There we go. Um, also captures the sadness, the painting by Tony Law, who was another naval war artist, but also a commander, in this case, of motor torpedo boats, also captures the sadness felt by many sailors of paying off and decommissioning of their ships. After the end of the Second World War, the, the RCN quickly shrank, and by late 1946 had an active strength of one aircraft carrier, two cruisers, two destroyers, a frigate, a minesweeper, and one captured German submarine. It would soon be rebuilt as Cold War tensions and the outbreak of war in Korea led to an unprecedented peacetime rearmament, but that is a story for another time. Thank you. air power in a way that isn't always obvious. And it isn't always obvious. If you're in a convoy in the middle of the Atlantic and the weather's perfectly fine, you might say, where's the air cover that we need? But it's also very possible that the reason the aircraft aren't showing up, um, it's also quite possible the reason the aircraft aren't available to show up is because the weather on land is so bad they can't take off for land. That's an indirect way the weather affects things, in the sense of it's not directly affecting the ships, but it's affecting what's unfolding there. Um, it, it, when weather gets sufficiently severe, and it's always worth reading memoirs, um, Alan Easton's 50 North comes to mind, uh, it, it requires much more fuel consumption, for instance, to make headway against storms, putting aside the entire risk of ship handling in those situations. So you actually run the risk of ships running out of fuel at sea. Uh, and the North Atlantic can be absolutely ferocious on its own, even without the addition um, of anybody trying to do you harm. Uh, but it's, there's also winter weather, freezing, um, ice accumulation on ships, which can lead to an absolute loss of stability. So many of the post photographs you see of sailors um, using axes to remove ice from ships, yes, they're post for publicity purposes, but it's a very real duty that had to be carried out if ships were actually to remain um, seaworthy and also capable of fighting. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, in the early years of the Battle of the Atlantic, there was um, some criticism from our allies of the Royal Canadian Navy being not doing a very good job in the North Atlantic. It, is that true that part of the reason for that was the fact that we were always the, uh, the last to get new equipment, new sonar, the various tools that were really needed that the other navies were grabbing right away? There's a series of factors that play into this. And availability of equipment is absolutely one of them, um, is that Canadian ships are laboring with older, well, with, with older models of radar, or in some cases, no radar. Um, long after many American and British ships are. There's also the problem with limited shipbuilding capacity for upgrades of existing corvettes, for instance. So I, one of the major changes that happens to corvettes during the Second World War, anyone who's been to Halifax and has had the privilege of touring HMCS Sackville, will see what Sackville looked more or less, more or less what Sackville looked like in 1945 at the end of the Second World War. Earlier in the war, um, the ship had far less accommodation space. The forecastle was a lot shorter, which affected operational effectiveness, amongst other things, and seaworthiness. Um, so it's a combination, and so those upgrades improve the improve the capability of ships. And it's also a matter of training as well. 
because the RCN, when you're trying to train personnel, you can take a cadre of 3,500 and put them to work training, or you wind up putting them to sea because the need for, for escorts is immediate. And the problem is the RCN is torn because there's an increasing demand for more and more ships to provide escort for convoys, but there isn't the time to train people. So it's a combination in many ways. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interaction between these various factors. So there is very much the problem of getting modern equipment, modern sensors, modern weapons, but also the challenge of trying to train this Navy when you have so little to work with. You have so few people to work with in the first place. Thank you. You're welcome. Could you comment on the manner in which the veterans from the Merchant Marine were treated relative to the Royal Canadian Navy servicemen after the war? Uh, sure, it's a, it's a good question. It's also a fairly complex one. We may not be able to get all the details exactly right, but essentially, um, at the end of the Second World War, there are fewer benefits, at, and that's putting it um, in a fairly restrained way, that are made available to Merchant Navy veterans than there are to uh, veterans of the Royal Canadian Navy. And in part this is because the government, at least publicly stated, or had the attitude that if you were already in the Merchant Navy, you could continue to be a Merchant Mariner in the post-war Merchant Navy. Um, so that it was, there wasn't necessarily the need to retrain or readapt to civilian life. The fact that much of the Canadian Merchant Navy does not, you know, it, the, the Canadian Merchant Navy shrinks substantially after 1945, and especially after the late 1940s, means that many of these opportunities aren't there. Um, what this ultimately leads to, and which many, many, of, many of the people here will remember, um, is starting in the 1980s, and especially into the 1990s, there was a very concerted and very public campaign by Merchant Navy veterans um, for official and prominent recognition as actual veterans on an equal footing with, say, veterans of the Royal Canadian Navy, or the Royal Canadian Air Force, um, or the Canadian Army, uh, access to benefits that, in some cases, that have been denied in many cases, um, which would lead to compensation for lost opportunities and lost benefits. And that's finally granted, and I believe I want to say 1994 or 1995, I may be off by a year or two on that. But it took basically 50 years after the end of the war for this to happen. And one of the things it did lead to, however, is a very active <coughs> Merchant Navy Veterans Association, which while many of the veterans are unfortunately no longer with us, their children in many ways carry on. Um, so we, we have them visit the museum from time to time. So it's always interesting to see people connect um, through service their parents might have had together, but they've never actually met as people, as, as individuals themselves. I'd love to, to see that painting of the Toronto Shipbuilding Company uh, for local consumption. Uh, it, it's amazing to, to learn that that shipbuilding company was where the music garden sits now. And as we sit on the music garden, it's, it's hard to imagine. Uh, anyway, read all about it in the next Fife and Drum. Oh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, you, you spoke of the dispersal of Canadian naval forces. We are in the North Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, off the European coast. And I'm wondering if there was any strategic debate in Ottawa at the beginning of the war about, about um, keeping these forces concentrated to have some kind of effect on the course of the war. That's, that's a very good question. And in the years leading up to September 1939, the Royal Canadian Navy um, actually does, is, is working on a doctrine and a, and a planned mission for the Navy. There's an expectation that the advent of ASDIC um, and convoys will constrain the U-boat threat, which for a variety of reasons, some of them understandable, some of them um, perhaps wishful thinking, uh, turns out not to be the case. The U-boat threat is much greater than had been anticipated, um, but some of that's the result of the events in 1940. I digress a little bit. But before the war, the Royal Canadian Navy had been training one of its primary missions, and this is one of the great outcomes of the Royal Canadian Navy official history that's been recently published in the research for it, is that the Royal Canadian Navy saw one of its major objectives as being countering enemy surface raiders. Um, and so the reason that destroyers start to be acquired in appreciable numbers in the 1930s, I mean, for much of the 20s, Canada has two destroyers, one on each coast. Um, but the acquisition of modern destroyers and the training is to counter the threat from German surface ships. Uh, so one of the reasons that, that the destroyers are being concentrated in Halifax in 1939 is partly out of concern about German surface raiders. 
but also because they're some of the few ships that are able to actually escort convoys. Um, there were ideas, and I don't know the details well enough, <coughs> sorry, to hold, forth, to hold forth in detail on this, but as the war unfolds, the Royal Canadian Navy certainly has grander visions than simply being what was sometimes called the Sheepdog Navy. Um, the acquisition of HMCS Uganda and HMCS Ontario, which are two, you know, the two cruisers, involvement in naval aviation points to what the Royal Canadian Navy wants to be post-war. Um, it, it never quite gets to that stage, but it does lead to the acquisition, for instance, of aircraft carriers and naval aviation um, through to the early 1970s. I hope that helps. It's not, probably not quite the answer you... Well, you were, yeah. I was wondering about how, in, in the first war, we kept our forces together yeah. and thereby gained strategic yeah. influence uh, it has come up in peacekeeping debates also, you know, penny packets here and there, and so we have no real influence on the, on, on the actual. Did any debate like that occur at all? I honestly don't know the answer to that, but I, but I, will, point, I, I will simply observe, though, that the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Navy were very tightly intertwined. Um, so many, in fact, any, uh, any Royal Canadian Navy officer wanted a chance of progression um, or even part of fundamental training would be training with the Royal Navy and quite often in Royal Naval vessels. So when Hood is sunk, for instance, there are Canadian, there are Newfoundlanders who are lost, but there are also Canadian midshipmen um, who, who perish in the sinking because they're doing part of their big ship training um, in Royal Navy vessels and that continues into the post-war period. So this is one of these elements of Canadian naval identity. Um, and the history of the Royal Canadian Navy, that it is so tightly entwined with, with the Royal Navy. So in some cases, people may not have seen themselves as being necessarily all that separate, although I can't overgeneralize because different people would have had different attitudes. So just a question about public relations. The Navy and the Air Force had to deal with conflicts literally on Canada's coast, so I wonder if you could speak to that angle. Oh, sure. And actually, I'll speak a little bit specifically about the Battle of the St. Lawrence because that's uh, that's what always strikes visitors to the War Museum. Um, but the, this was actually news, although not necessarily in a detailed way, during the Second World War. Canadians knew that ships were being sunk in the St. Lawrence. Um, if you lived along the St. Lawrence, you really knew that it was happening because there'd be explosions out to sea at night and lifeboats with survivors would literally show up on people's front doorsteps. Um, and so part of the way that propaganda gets used to counter this is that the National Film Board is used. Um, of course, one of the functions the National Film Board performs during the Second World War is propaganda, so it carries on and things like that. But they also do a whole series of films made especially for consumption in Quebec, so they're only ever released in French, apparently, um, that talk about preparations along the St. Lawrence against enemy attack and the possibility of enemy landings. And you have all the good and the great and the local dignitaries who are out to literally in some cases bless these undertakings um, because you have a local bishop for instance uh, but showing how everyone locally is involved in the efforts to defend against the possibility of an attack and how the air force is there, the army is there, the navy is there. How persuasive it is I don't know but it's certainly one of the uses to which the navy is put which is to say look at what we're doing um, and the navy certainly puts in appearances regularly in propaganda films most of which of course anyone's ever tried to watch action stations days is um, mixed with difficult watching, uh, largely because of the narration, which is politically dramatic, but, uh, but that's a product of the times, though. Half a question? Very, well, very, very quickly. Uh, relative to what Tom said, and we are talking about Second World War, but really the fact is, don't you think that we are the second largest land mass? We sent almost 10% of our population away in the First World War. So we didn't have the population, did we, really? But interestingly, because my grandfather on my mother's side was Royal Navy, and he wanted to uh, enroll in the Royal Canadian Navy, he got seconded to do something else for us. But weren't there quite a few people in our Navy that were Royal Navy who were immigrants to Canada that gave us at least that contextual strength of experience? Oh, oh absolutely. And that was actually one of the sections I unfortunately had to cut from this column. But um, one of the great problems that arises from having such a small navy in the First World War and interwar period is that not just the cadre of, you know, of petty officers to train, you know, to, 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 to train new seamen, but also is a limited experience for officers for staff duties and other work. And so in the Second World War, the Royal Canadian Navy draws upon retired 
Canadian naval officers, but also for various British naval officers. So, for instance, E.S. Brand in, um, in Ottawa, who is one of these unheralded figures, is responsible for the control of naval shipping and also for naval intelligence. And there are a fair number of former Royal Navy personnel during both World Wars um, who are either seconded to the, to the Royal Canadian Navy uh, or who are serving the Royal Navy while they're here in Canada. Uh, so there is this exchange and this drawing upon prior experience and, uh, and prior knowledge. Uh, Dr. Oaks, on behalf of the RCMI, thank you very much. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.